We turn in for our reading from the Word of God this morning to the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah 12. But we're going to read the first part of chapter 11 too. Isaiah chapter 11 gives the setting for what we find in 12. Remember at this time in the history of Israel and Judah, the nation of Assyria was very, very strong. And it eventually took away and destroyed all of the ten tribes of Israel and every part of the land of Judah except Jerusalem, surrounded the city of Jerusalem, in fact. So the nation of Israel has gone. The nation of Judah is being threatened. And so they were despairing. And in the midst of that despair, Isaiah is inspired to say there's going to come another kingdom. The kingdom of David had long been gone, but now they say here. Verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The tree had been cut down, so all you have is the stump. And that's what it looked like as far as the kingdom of David was concerned. But now there's going to come a branch out of that root. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Those different, three different parts refer to the three different offices, prophet, priest, prophet, king, and priest in that order. Wisdom and understanding, prophet, counsel and might, king, knowledge and the fear of the Lord, priest. And shall make him a, of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. A little child shall feed them, and the cow and bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the wean child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now it's in that setting. So verse 10 says, And in that day shall the root of Jesse. Now go to chapter 12, and you've got the same language in verse 1. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord. Call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. So far we read from God's word. The text, at the request of Isaiah's parents, is the twelfth, the second verse of the twelfth chapter. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. So it's obvious by reading from chapter 11 that that chapter describes a very peaceful kingdom. 
uses the figure of all the animals that usually would fight or kill each other or other animals, all at peace. So he describes a peaceful kingdom under this root that will arise, um, this branch that will grow out of the root of Jesse. So a descendant of De Jesse and David, which is obviously a reference to Christ, Jesus. Then we have this joyful words here in chapter 12, and we focus on that second verse. I will trust, I will trust Jehovah and not be afraid. We want to look first of all at the concept of trust. Then secondly, we want to look at the basis of that trust. And finally, the result of that trust that will all come out of that second verse. To trust. The Hebrew word batak is translated trust. And that Hebrew word literally all by itself means to be secure, to be confident, to be safe. The figure in, in the Hebrew often is a picture language, so it draws pictures. The, the picture language is that you will be able, as it were, to lean on something and you know it's going to be hold you up. From a physical viewpoint, every single one, single one of you did that a few times already this morning. You didn't think of it because you're so accustomed to it happening, but you sat down in a chair you knew would hold you up. Now you didn't think because you've seen it happen when you were a child, adult, and then you did it. In fact, you're very surprised if all of a sudden the chair would break, but that doesn't happen very often. So you're sat down, assured, that chair will hold me up. You leaned on it and rested in that of confidence. That's the figure, the picture, that God uses to describe what it is to trust in Jehovah. Just as we unconsciously have a confidence in that chair, spiritually, our mind must go to the confidence that we can have in his attitude toward us. What is God's attitude toward us so that we can trust him, lean on him, be confident and secure in him? As we read out of the baptism form, which arises out of all of the scriptures, that trust is confidence is because we know that his attitude toward us is one that began in eternity and it's never going to change unto all eternity. It's an attitude that's determined by his taking us and giving us to his beloved son and having a relationship with us because we're in that son. So he looks at us just as he looks at his son. No different. So tonight, the Lord willing, we're going to consider the name of Jesus, that he is the son of God. But that name, Jesus, as the son of God, is a name that he gives to us. So that we are adopted children of God. More than humans can adopt a child, our Father adopts us so that we're given the privilege, as I just used that word, that Jesus says, every time I want you to pray, I want you to know the confidence that you can have in that God that you're praying to so that you can address him, our Father, our Father. We're going to trust the attitude that he describes in his word that he has for us, his adopted children. And then we can be secure. Secure that 
all the different things that seem in this world to be attacking us and to be against us, all the things that we experience in this life that make us very, very nervous and uncomfortable, coronavirus, different relationships with other people, other illnesses, all the difficulties of this life, all the unknowns that lie ahead, we know his relationship to us. And that's the key. To trust in him is to know that there will not be any from him effort to punish because he laid on Jesus the punishment for all of our sins. We're very conscious and we grow in the consciousness that our sins earn from him a wrath. The wages of sin is death, and death is God's wrath against us. Why, because we still sin, don't we get that wrath? We look at the cross. We're incorporated into Jesus. So we died when he died. We arose when he arose. And that's what frees us from the knowledge that we're going to be punished or that anything that happens to us is a form of divine punishment. No, he does chasten us because he loves us. A father chastens his children. We need to be reminded. We need to get our focus back. We struggle to keep our focus where it ought to be. His chastening is to say, look at me. And now running ahead just a little bit, look at the very first word in chapter, verse 2 of chapter 12. Very first word. You all know it? Behold. Behold means look. It calls our attention. Look at this. So we're looking elsewhere. We're looking over here. Look. Behold, Jehovah and his attitude. When we trust, then we're taking our reliance, our trust, away from other things, ourselves, or other things. See, it is very natural for us to go through life with either one attitude or the other. There are some whose personalities and characters are of such a nature that they're very tentative and they're very afraid. Every, anything that may happen, they, they go through life timidly. They're afraid of death. They're afraid of people. They're afraid of the dark providences of God. They're afraid of sin's consequences. But then there's others, and it's often what we sometimes call the cockiness of youth. I can handle it. I don't have anything to be afraid about. I've got it. Something comes, I'll take care of it. Both of them are ditches. Both are going to be failures. Sometimes those who trust also have times when we're afraid. Scared. God suddenly brings something in our life. And we're terrified. Some of us experienced that when the coronavirus hit. But there's all sorts of other things that we have in our lives. So we trust, but still can be afraid. And that's why God comes to us and to Israel this way. And he calls us to look at him. Trust and not be afraid. Trust takes away fear. Notice that. Trust 
takes away fear. I wrote down some verses. Now notice the frequency. These are just some. Psalm 3, verse 6. I will not be afraid when ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. I will not fear. Verse Psalm 27. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident that Jehovah is my light and my salvation and the strength of my life. Whom shall I fear? Of what shall I be afraid? Psalm 56, verse 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Psalm 56, verse 11. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Notice, trust takes away fear. Psalm 91, verse 5. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Psalm 112, verse 7. He shall not be afraid of evil things. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Psalm 112, verse 7. Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. For what can man do unto me? Psalm 125, verse 1. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. How about other parts of Isaiah? 41, verse 10. Fear thou not, fear thou not, for I am with thee, be not dismayed, I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness, for I, the Lord, thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Psalm 43, verse 1, very familiar. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. How about Isaiah 51, verse 12 and following? I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die, and of the son of man which shall be made as grass? And forgettest the Lord thy maker, that hath stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, and hast feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were able to destroy? And where is the fury of the oppressor? But I, the Lord thy God, that divided the sea, whose waves roared, the Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth, and say unto Zion, Thou art my people. Notice his relationship. I, thou art my people. Trust his relationship to you and not be afraid. Hebrews 13, verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. His relationship, he is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Verse after verse after verse, and that's only some. There's more. Trust. To lean on. To be secure and confident of his relationship to us. The basis of that, what's the basis for that trust? What's the basis for that confidence? And the answer to that is found in the name the name that God gives of to himself in this verse. 
Literally, it's there twice. When the word Lord in the King James is all in capitals, then it's Jehovah in the Hebrew. And so is the name Jehovah. So it's double. For Jehovah, Jehovah is, now here's his relationship to us, is my strength and my song and my salvation. But his name is, start there, who is he? Jehovah, Jehovah. Now, literally, Jehovah means I am, just that. Or as he said it to Moses when he identified himself in the, out of the burning bush, I am that I am. We are not able to say I am without the next second saying I was and I will be. We're always changing. But he is always, I am. Behind that unchangeableness of God is something that's the foundation. Why doesn't he change? Why doesn't he have to change? And it's because I am declares that God is self-sufficient because he's self-existent. We the little children got their being from their parents through the instrumentality of their parents. That our heart keeps beating is very dependent upon other things. Our God's got to keep it working. Well, God doesn't depend on anything outside of himself. He is everything he needs in himself. I am self-sufficient because he's self-existent. Now, that self-sufficient, self-existent one is the reason why he never changes. He never vacillates. He doesn't make a promise and then forget it or make a promise and say, well, now I can't keep it or I changed my mind. None of that in God. He's Jehovah. That self-sufficient one is able to do all things. Nothing is impossible with him. That's what he said to Mary. He comes to Mary with the angel and, and says, you're a virgin. You've not known a man. You're going to have a baby. Because with God, nothing's impossible. With man, it's impossible. But with God, not. Can a camel go through the eye of a needle? Yes, God can do it. Can a virgin give birth? Yes, God can do it. Can the death of one and experiencing hell take care of all of the hells of all of his people? Yes, God can do it. Nothing is impossible with him. Now that Jehovah is first my salvation. Wait a minute. Twice in the verse. He is my salvation. Yes, we can say our. But Isaiah wants you to say my. Cole, yourself, Justin, you. Each of us, just me. Very personal. He is my salvation. Because he established a relationship. He picked me. He made me holy. He loves me. Why? Because he wants to. That's all. Just because he wants to. Because he can. That's why he does it. So it's not, I've earned it. I might lose it because I've unearned it. Nope. He's self-existent. Existed, self-sufficient. It arises only because of him. He is who he is, and he is the one who saves us. He does that by doing a work for us in Jesus Christ. So that Jesus does everything that's necessary for all of those given him of the Father. He takes their sins upon himself. He suffers what their sins earn them. He takes upon himself. 
But because he is God, the Son of God, that gives value to his life. That gives infinite value and worth to his suffering and to his dying. So it was, it was with him able to take our eternities and endure it during his lifetime and especially in the three hours of darkness on the cross. He experienced the fullness of that wrath. So when the light came again, he could say, it is finished. That's my salvation. That's what he did for me. So now things might not always go wrong. I might hit my thumb with a hammer. I might have other issues and problems in my life. But I know it's not because he's punishing me because I did something violating him. But rather he's saying, I'm calling your attention. You're not looking at me. You're not focused as you ought. He does it for us. Saves us. He also does it in us. He saves my, he is my salvation within us. He indwells us. He gives us to have a life that's from above. He enables us to, be, to believe and to love him back in return. He draws us to himself. He shows us the false security of earthly riches and trusting in the things of this earth. He shows us how weak we are. We cannot trust in ourselves. He enables us to say with the apostle, when I'm weak, when I admit I can't, then am I strong. He enables us to be able to say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He is my salvation. He is my strength. Why can't I when he is my strength? So that not I am doing it, but he is doing it through me. It's his strength that strengthens us so that we are able to keep our eye focused, not shy away, be constant in watching and prayer. And now again, behold, look. Many times in the course of our days, God says that. And when we have an ear or a mind that's sensitive to the voice of God, Here's the struggle. I, like you, can be here on Sunday. We get it. But we can get a phone call of some tragedy in the family, loved one. It shakes us. We can go to work tomorrow and we get taken up with all the different things of work. There's all sorts of things in our lives that grab our attention and we focus. And God says, look at me. And when he gives us this salvation and he opens our, he doesn't just give us the eyes to see him, he gives us the ability to use those eyes to keep our focus on him. Exercising faith to see. Behold, behold, calls our attention. This word expresses the wonder. Sometimes we say, look at that, with wonder and admiration. But it makes us get our attention away from what we ought not see to look at him. And that's why frequently to young people, I will simply use this expression. Look up. Just look up. Put God into the picture of your mind. He's there. He's always there. But we don't always see him, but he's there. What's the result of that trust? When you see Jehovah, Jehovah as my salvation, my strength, well, then it's this. He becomes my song.
When I'm not knowing joy, let that be a, sh a divine shout that you're not looking where you ought. Let us realize that when we don't look, behold him, whose attitude toward us is described so beautifully and wonderfully, who promises such a glorious kingdom, then we're not only dishonoring him, but we're bringing sorrow to ourselves. Fear takes away joy. Someone said it this way, do not be afraid to trust Jehovah. Rather, be afraid not to trust him. The knowledge and the experience of what he thinks of you in Jesus Christ opens our mouths of praise. It doesn't take long before the children as their favorite numbers say, 55 or 53, versifications of Psalm 23. And then when they get older, and it takes a hold of us as to what that really means, then 52, where twice it says, no want shall I know, no want, I lack nothing. Because Jehovah has this attitude that he is my shepherd. I don't have to fear or be afraid. He's got me. He upholds me. He's mine. Then I can trust his promises. And I can rejoice that he gives a promise of glory, peace. So that that's a part of the prayers twice for those children this morning in that form. This, we're, we, we're, they're going to live to praise him eternally. That's why we teach them. Make that their focus. Trust gives us boldness to go forward in his service, strong in his might, wise to conquer all evil and stand for the right. Trust so we sing. With our minds and hearts, not just words, but now the words take on a meaning that just thrill us. Sometimes we can't sing because we're choked up at what we're saying. My sins, not in part, but the whole, are nailed to the cross, and I bear them no more. How great thou art. Great is thy faithfulness. Jehovah is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He's the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Fear thou not. I am with thee. Be not dismayed. I am thy God. Amen. Let us pray. Bless thy word. Carry it by thy spirit. So we grasp it, so we delight in it, so we're ever thankful to thee for it, so we sing, drawing from the wells of salvation with great joy. Thanks, Father. Amen.